Welcome to Left Right Out. Uh, another day, another dollar to be made in the market, let's just say. Uh, last week was pretty interesting. We had some uh, decent volatility. I said decent because we actually need a reflection in reality in the markets, and hopefully that will be taking place. Um, but uh, come you know, yesterday and um, some parts of today, from what I've seen, we have a sh what I call short covering. I mean, you have guys that have made significant amount of money shorting this market. And it's best just to take profit sometimes for the risk of some, you know, Fed blunder or whatever. He might say something that might spark uh, an actual uh, an actual rally or something or a major sell-off or whatever. It's just lock in some of these profits. Get prepared for the next um, push downward. Um, so, I mean, that's what I see in this. You can only have so much short selling and then you just like you can't, well, root. In a normal period, you can't just have markets go straight up. And likewise, you don't have markets go straight down. There's always this flushing around of, of, of whatever money is in the markets and, and um, competing ideologies uh, going at each other. But the interesting thing today was that uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Powell was giving testimony on, on the Hill today or on Congress or in a congressional testimony. And some of these guys are just, well, we've known this, that our congressional members are not necessarily the most intelligent people when it comes to economics, uh, especially monetary policy. Some of them have a grasp on supply and demand and on the, on some of the fiscal side of things, but they don't understand the monetary uh, phenomena or what inflation actually is uh, and what monetary policy, the implications that monetary decisions have upon um, all demand and, all, and, and on supply uh, uh, capital markets or whatnot they have no idea and if anything they have just a monocom of any kind of understanding of that so you know n no shortage of idiotic questions being asked to pal and i'm i i don't you know i'm not a pal apologist that's for sure i don't like the federal reserve i'd rather have a free market system and money a free a pricing mechanism that's based on a free enterprise system where you know saving your uh rates are set by you know the time value money and savings uh supply and demand where we will have more economic growth and less you know huge shocks to the system uh, but anyway that's yeah that's besides the point i'm going in the rabbit hole pal i felt sorry for him in, in the extent that some of the questions were so dumb granted the reason why he's up there is like well one he's telling them what they're doing monetarily but also to give advice to congress i mean that's what i thought the whole point was but he you know didn't do any of that he kept referring back to it. he wants to stay away from that and it's like he's just there going through the motions but anyway some of the questions especially about the oil companies and this uh like like they're the ones that are responsible for the price hikes which i guess in theory i mean in reality they rise the they rise prices uh but it's also you know because they want to stay in business <laughs> and and then you also have to think about uh inventory and viability, you know, three, six months, five year, five years down the line, 10 years down the line in some cases, you know, or, or further. So you have to price accordingly in order to maintain certain cash flows or, or to be able to replenish stock or to have inventories. I mean, so there's a lot more than just like, oh, we're going to raise prices just because we, we feel like it or we want to gouge people. It's like, well, if they're gouging now, why didn't they gouge later? There's usually some sort of margin in there. There's usually a lot, you know, some sort of planning involved. I mean, I guess not all the time now that we got some really piss poor leadership in various other companies that are subsidized by the U.S. government. Uh, but anyway, there they, this one gal just kept bashing Powell over this, like, well, you know, what are, what are you going to do about the oil company? And he said, well, a lot of the oil prices are set by a cartel, which we all know is OPEC or OPEC Plus, whatever you want to call them, which they don't just... <sighs> They are a cartel and they do set prices to a certain extent by, but they don't set the price. The price is set uh, by others because there's other, you know, they're only comprised what I think uh, less than half of the oil market. So, I mean, yeah, it's a big bull in that closet that's, you know, they're pushing up and down on the prices, no doubt about it. But I mean, there's others involved as well. And the less that the less threat of extra supply coming in the market, the more you know, power they have because they're willing to increase supply, decrease supply, do whatever they want. But he kept, you know, this, so this cartel kind of is the one that sets the, you know, has the biggest weighting in setting of the price, not necessarily our oil companies, um, but they operate off that. And then, she, you know, 
she didn't get that. She thought our co companies are part of that cartel, which I guess maybe through contracting through these countries, but it's mainly these countries that are dictating that. And they have their own, you know, a lot of them have state sponsored oil companies and they might, you know, contract out through some of ours with some of the technology drilling or whatnot. That's a whole nother deal, but to, to keep it above those weeds. Then she went into the trading desk of these, some of these oil companies and mentioning some people get fined that the fact that these guys have some tra trading desks that they are operating in the futures markets, which I was sitting there. I was like, of course, of course they do. Have you ever looked at any of their balance sheets or how they operate? These guys hedge a lot of times. There's and some traders that you look at this too, when they have a huge spike in oil prices, you look at, well, who's hedged this? Who has it sold contracts out to their oil and they're not going to be able to take advantage of these rising prices or on the converse or, or, or yeah, on the other side of things, who hedged out when we have a huge decrease in oil prices, who locked in high prices. So yeah, they're usually oil companies have a certain percentage of their, you know, their revenues are based off hedged prices, selling futures into the market and, uh, you know, future production. And that is to stabilize cash flows, you know, so they have some kind of idea or it's easier for them to project their earnings or whatnot, or, or, or you know, stabilize their earnings. So that makes sense. That's what a business does. You see that in other industries. You see that in farming, especially. You see that in, you know, any kind of agricultural commodity or uh, industry, there's a, large operations hedge prices. That's the whole point of the futures market. And so I don't, these people don't understand some of this stuff. So they're blaming these oil companies. Of course they have a trading desk. That's part of being that kind of a company. I, I, I didn't get it. I, I don't get it. I mean, actually, you know, the most coherent, there was a couple of, I mean, I, I turned it off after a while. I, I was actually semi impressed because I just, I'm giving them a handicap like in golf. Like I know that these guys don't understand monetary policy whatsoever, but if their their question seems to be out of well intention, you know, good heartedness. And I'm like, okay, I'll give them a pass and like, what's going on. So I was actually impressed with my Senator, uh, John Tester. Um, not impressed. I was just like, okay, comparative to his idiotic, uh, bros and sisters up there, uh, in, in, on this hearing, like he is, he, he seemed to be more, ah, man, uh, at least more cognizant. And usually, and here's a little side thing the people in, uh, in Montana have told me like, he's probably the dumbest person they've ever met. Like the people that, but, but anyway, but he actually doesn't seem that bad. He, he seems like the more rational person in the room to be totally honest. And I think that derives from the fact, especially when you when all of everybody else is bashing oil companies, like that guy actually owns, I believe he owns, I know what was told me, he owns some farms. I think I, I'm, I'm saying this because he might have sold them or what, I don't know. But his family's into agriculture. So they understand at least a little bit of how, uh, you know, commodities are priced, how to deal with futures, um, or they have an understanding of hedging and future contracts or whatever. So he has a little bit of understanding of certain things that these other guys don't. And a lot of some of these rural people that are actually involved in uh, production of some sort of good uh, understand it, not just selling their influence. But so Powell is up there in, you know, like I said, giving BS answers, but also um, getting BS questions as well. Nobody, you don't have a, a Rand Paul there or a Thomas Massey there that understands the monetary system and can give coherent questions and really put them on there. Cause what, what to me, you know, we can, we don't even have to talk about the current rate of inflation to get to the base problem and just ask certain questions that anybody could understand. Like, well, you guys are saying like the neutral rate, which he said was like two and a half percent. Well, how does that make any sense when prices are rising at whatever an annual rate of eight, six, um, does that seem like a neutral rate to you? It seems like you're still in a negative real, uh, rate there. Uh, two, you just said that uh, across the curve, you're in real rates, which that doesn't make any sense either. When you're looking at 30 years at three something, 10 years, you're looking at a flattening yield curve and um, or a pretty flat yield curve, or at least an upward revision of that yield curve. But then also CPI, or which I'll call rising prices at 8.6 or whatever percent annually. Let's just give it to them. Even if it's at five, you're still at a negative rate. There, I cut my video off too <laughs> in the middle of that. But how does that work? The other question is, well, you just told me that you're, which we've all known, like, well, you guys uh, believe in 2% annual inflation. Well, how does that work if we know inflation or is that some uh, inflation is deleterious in, it, in its very nature to uh, the average, to earning savings and whatnot and, uh, um, and it's 
it, it deprives people of the benefits of um, falling prices or stabilized prices. So what are you saying that 2% uh, devaluation of my purchasing power yearly is a good thing or that's um, stabilized, stabilized prices? If your mandate stabilized pricing or stabilized prices, then why isn't zero or zero to point a half percent the actual goal? Um, I don't know. I got to move here uh, real quick. But uh, the other question I'd ask, like, okay, um, oh man, I just lost it. It's like, yeah, the, what, why is 2% stable, uh, a stable price as opposed to zero uh, percent inflation? But uh, the other thing is, okay, well, if you're recognizing the current price ri uh, rising prices are a problem and you have recognized over the last few months, why aren't we acting um, with more initiative? Why are we waiting to raise rates to what you consider the neutral rate? Why are you allowing the deleterious effect of inflation to continue if you know it's a problem? And why are you waiting to act? What is the point of that? What is the rationale? What are your basis for that? Um, but nobody will answer those questions because they don't know how, they don't have follow-up questions. They just don't have it. They don't have the the uh, the mental faculties or the knowledge to do so. So whatever answer they give, which a lot of his answers are just like going off the um, are just basically the same answer repeated over and over again. And nobody challenges them. I think Elizabeth Warren is the only one to really challenge them, even though her understanding of economics is so far off. She might as well be in so uh, Stalin's Soviet Union. Um, but she's, uh, she has no understanding. Um, she'd rather them put the pedal to the metal, lower interest rates and try to, um, keep this bubble going. I think she feels the effects of it on her side of things when it comes to the party, because the party line is what matters. She's part of this group and the incentives and the political power that she can accumulate in those kind of policies, uh, matter more than the, than uh, the American uh, American public and America's economy in, in, as a whole, um, it's it, there's a whole faction of people that just want power, and it's it's easy to allow the bifurcation of American society and not allow you know they don't want people to be able to save or do anything they want to have a small group of people running everything so they can control them. There's it's it's a fascist movement in, in, in a sense, but anyway, the, another question being is like well. I would ask this question. Okay, well, when is the Fed thinking about cutting rates? <laughs> I would just say, when is the Fed thinking about cutting rates? Uh, when is the Fed going back? Or I'd ask about the QT. Why hasn't the Fed, because you just said QT started at the end of May or June. Why hasn't the balance sheet? You even mentioned in this that you've been selling securities in the markets. Well, why are your securities holdings increasing over the last few weeks, if that is the case? And follow-up question uh, granted, it would depend upon his actual answer then to follow up, but just considering that he, that I don't have him here to question. What is, when is the Fed going back to QE? I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying these questions, not because I already know pretty much the answer that he's not going to answer it, but I want it on the record in there that, hey, I know the game. People know the game that this thing is not last, and this is a show, a force that's not there. And that you're going to go back to stimulating once you fail this thing, once you destroy what we've driven us in the recession, which we are in a recession, in my opinion, and you're destroying, and you do affect supply. Here's how, here how the Fed rates, they affect demand, but here's how it affects the supply in a sense. It affects supply in a sense because it, it controls the price of money. It's fixing the price of money, which is part of access to capital, which allows you to go and invest in increasing supply uh, by whatever factories or, you know, capital goods in a sense. So it, it is pricing the, uh, in, in determining access to capital. So it does have an effect somewhat on supply. Of course, it does have a, a huge effect on the man. We call it the consumer side of things. But anyway, I want to wrap that up. Let's look at these things when we go into the market. Cause we, I, I always say, look at the bond market, but when we're looking at this, when the feds in the midst of this, when we're, we're actually looking for signs of the pivot back because when they give up and they cry uncle, Here's what we look for, because even no matter what they do, if there is an expansion in consumer credit, you still have an inflationary environment. Uh, so, I mean, there's more things to it, but that's one in particular I'm looking at. We're looking at the consumer. We need to look at the consumer debt side of things and pay attention to that, because that will tell us when we actually have uh, that's 
we actually have, uh, you know, things changing, pivoting, and might have a Fed pivot. 